computer. Good morning. This is the First Lady Erica, your cosmic mama, and I'm hanging out with the magical, mystical Missy Barnes. <laughs> and um, we we were just getting started and flowing, and you had some titles that you call yourself. Um, I wanted to meet you because I had a chance to go down to the college and see one of your plays that oh, your yeah. students put on. Yeah, I did last okay. year. And yeah. then um, and then we also met in one of our oil morpher classes mm -hmm. and you called yourself a joy activator, right? Yes. Am I yeah. Right? And I was like, oh, my God, I want to talk to you. <laughs> So um, I don't really know much about your journey and how long you've been working with uh, healing, laughter, and modalities of such, but how how long have you been working with this type of energy where you're trying to help the world heal? Um, thank you for that question, Erica. Um, <laughs> so really, since I was really young, um, uh -huh. I would say... I was always the one, if somebody was upset or hurt as a child, I would be the one to quickly go to them and want to help them feel better. So even people that I wasn't close friends with at school, if somebody was upset, somehow we would find our way to, to be sitting next to each other and they would tell me all the things and I would want to say things to help them feel better. So I think it's just part of my DNA. Um, and I would say I went through a pretty dark, I went through my dark, my first dark night of the soul when I was really young. I was actually in high school. I was a teenager um, and I didn't know what it was, you know, I didn't know, but I, I experienced severe depression and anxiety for, um, for an extended period of time. Um, and I got really interested. I, I didn't do well with traditional therapy. Uh, you know, I had a, a psychiatrist first who was an, a much older white man who I did not resonate with. Um, and then he was retiring or something. And then I got passed to someone who was younger, still a, a white man, but like a little younger. Um, but I still didn't super resonate with him. And at some point, and they would try me on medication. And I didn't like, it didn't, I, I have, I've always had strange reactions to medications. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So, right. So, um, and I love to read. So I would find books that were like uplifting. One of the first books I remember reading, there was one, um, everything I needed to know I learned in kindergarten. Uh. And um, that was a little later, but, and then there's uh, this, this um, chicken soup for the soul books. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I would, I would read those books and just think was like, these people's stories are beautiful and, Oh, I can, I can, make choices of how I spend my time and the way I think I don't, you know, have to sit here just be, you know, like circling around how the world is upsetting and people treat other people terribly. And, you know, the things that my mind would wrap around that were much more abstract than my immediate life. Like it wasn't my immediate life necessarily. It was all the terrible things about how people treated each other and oppressions and, and the world. And anyway, um, and so then this is a really long story, uh, it seems like, but then um, in when I was in um, studying to be a theater, um, to get my degrees in theater, because I realized I wanted to teach theater. That's what I've always loved is um, the arts, like performing arts. So theater, music, dance was always my excitement. And I'd been told by people who were very well-meaning when I was you know, in high school that that's you don't have a career in that. That's not a way to make a living. And so I believed them. So I couldn't figure out what my career path was going to be. And one day when, when I did figure out what, but I'm being part of theater and teaching dance and doing these other things. So why couldn't I make that? My, why couldn't I finish my degrees in that and, and live my life, you know, in that world, teaching other young people. Um, I, I saw in, in my undergraduate program as a, an older returning student, I was introduced to this technique that's about how much we don't realize we have choice over our thought patterns. And it's really about, it's a psychophysical technique about body mind. Um, so it's much more about how our thoughts dictate how our body, how we use our bodies, um, and then how we use our bodies affects we are thinking. So it's, it's this sort of symbiotic 
um, relationship. And it was, it's not a healing technique, um, but I got really fascinated by it. And I ultimately trained to become a teacher of that after I finished my undergraduate and graduate degrees to be able to teach um, at a college level. Um, and in through that, I also started um, taking Reiki classes um, because I was nervous about I didn't I didn't feel comfortable putting my hands on people. Uh-huh. Um, and that was part of my training in this technique called the Alexander technique. Um, but I also started studying these other um, modalities and I just loved all of it. And when I went to classes, I just remember one of my first, I think it was healing touch. I can't remember because I did healing. I did a whole list of them wow. um, when I lived in North Carolina, um, like, you know, like one weekend kind of training. So nothing in depth. The Alexander program was very in depth. Um, but I would, people would say, the teacher would say, oh, you must have done this before. And my first class, I said, no, I haven't. I just really, really like it and feel really drawn to it. Um, so clearly there was some kind of natural affinity for for it. Um, and certainly, you know, it was always my tendency if somebody was hurting to want to like put my hand on their I was going to say, you've of- been doing it since you were a child. Yeah, since so yeah, basically that's you know that since I was a kid, yeah, and an interest um, in in things spiritual and metaphysical um, without really knowing. Like I always loved rocks. My sister and I loved rocks and shells, and we would collect them and play with them. Um, we had a Ouija board, which we were both terrified of. Like we played with it, and then we were like, "No, this needs to go in the closet. Do not touch that." Um, yeah, and then. Um, yeah, I just started, I had somebody in the early 1990s mentioned to me that there was a metaphysical bookstore and shop sort of near the house I'd moved into. And I said, Oh, I want to go check that out. So that's when I started collecting crystals and books on everything, you know, books on angels and tarot and healing and all the things. Um, so so yeah, but my my initial your question was really like my my initial initial was from a young age, always wanting to hug hug people who are upset or or sit by them and you know just be there, whether talk to them or just be there with them. That kind of person is just that kind of person. I mean, I I remember that like the childhood of like massaging and then going ooh next to the shoulder and and then going to one of Michelle's classes and learning that that's called wind song, you know, that mm-hmm. thing. So you're like, what? like, I just thought I was doing stuff. I, I was like, woo. <laughs> I was like, woo, woo by nature, but, right. not, but not knowing why. Yeah. I know when we grew up, me and my sister were just talking the other day that we would walk down the street and there was a, um, a tarot reader and we would just look at it and we would <laughs> want to just, like, what is it? Like, we wanted to see and know we were attracted to it, but our grandmother would make us walk on the other side of the road that we couldn't even walk past it. Wow. And maybe they knew, like, these two little jokers, they like 10, they'll get some money and get up there <laughs> and go get a tarot reading or something. <laughs> but uh, they were really strict on us. It was so funny. And I said, can you imagine if we knew anything about astrology? Because I mean, I grew up in the born in the seventies. People would say, "What? What's your sign?" You see the people in the movies saying, "What's your sign?" But if if we had known that kind of stuff, I feel like we would have been farther ahead in life. So oh, interesting that you say that, Erica. That just reminded me how my friends and I loved to buy certain magazines that had your monthly horoscope yeah. in it. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yes. Yes, we would do that, and then I remember. I think it was Cosmopolitan magazine that would have a, um like the yearly astrology guide that came out at the end of or the beginning of the year, or the end of the fall, you know, previous year. I forgot that. And I would always buy like they would have these little Zodiac um, astrology scroll things at the drugstore. Yeah. Yes, go yes, buy the yes, magazines and those. Little, yeah. So that's so funny. I kind of forgotten that because I don't astrology is not an area I've spent a lot of it, it would take so much like focus for me to to process that. So I'm actually currently studying tarot more in depth. Um yeah, I'll see you. I'll see you on yes, the <laughs> yes. but it but it take like I you know I get 
uh, like I read and then I can't remember it all, you know, so I, I need to figure uh, out a, a system. It's a lot. It, it is a lot. And even though I've been using the cards for years um, and studying it a little bit, like I wanted to get more intentional yeah, exactly. and specific, but the same with astrology, right? There's all of the, there's so many details, all the houses and the placements and yeah, one day I might, or I might leave it to the people who are the experts. Yeah, the yeah exactly. Yeah. It, it was just, I just felt like we would have been so much further along in life because we'd know, um, oh, well, my boss is a Scorpio. His his moon is full, full moon is Scorpio. I better stay away. You know, I was like, we could have better jobs now. <laughs> we would have just been aware of the people around us. But even for me, like I'm born on October 23rd, my whole life until I was in my mid 40s, maybe. I thought I was a Scorpio and found out I was a Libra. Me too. On September 30th. Oh, was your September 30th. Okay, so yeah, you're Libra, like me. Yeah. And my son and my sister and and, and her husband. And uh, I even just met another lady the other day. Both of our birthdays are October 23rd, but she literally is a Scorpio and I'm a Libra. But we even both worked in the lab before interesting I thought this is like oh my god this is amazing <laughs> so we're getting along like gravy so um before the summer well can you tell us more about what it means to be the joy activator yes so I think that that's also been part of my life you know I talked about my dark night of the soul period when I was a teenager but before that my family says that I was basically the smiley, happy young person that especially even when I was a baby, that that if I cried, they knew something was wrong because I wasn't one to cry much. And I just kind of be like, la, la, la. Yeah. Um, and I, I remember as a kid, like getting excited by nothing, you know, like just getting excited because something was interesting or this book I'm reading. I love it so much. So I have this, I think, internal like desire to be more in a place of joy. And then my dark night of the soul, like took me out of that for a while. And then when I, I, I think I would say when I was studying acting really, um, and I was studying because I am an actor, but I'm also, you know, a teacher of acting. And I love both of them. I love being an actor and I love teaching acting. Um, you know, part of training can be about really digging into how to express the deepest level of emotional experience. Um, and I had trouble getting to anger because I, I just, you know, I internalized it all. And so, so I experienced like these depths of, of emotional truth that was connected to, you know, like a created situation that wasn't my real life. Um, and then one of the um, acting techniques, and I've always like approached my teaching with the sense of it's playful and and let's let go of it has to be good and right, because what does that mean? Maybe it could be fun. You know, so I tell my students a lot. Of, we often make a list um, when they're going to share one of their new pieces, whether it's a song or a monologue or, you know, I say, let's make a list of some of the goals you want to be focusing on. And they always say, oh, yeah, have fun. Like they want, you know, because I say that's so important as an artist to really to love what you're doing. Um, and so one of the acting techniques that I've studied in depth has as a basis for everything you're doing, this underlying feeling of joy that you get to create and share with other humans like that the experience you know the you're living the life of the character to connect with the audience for them to think and feel and experience with you um and that while not every character is experiencing joy all the time they that you you the artist can have underlying joy at the the so honor what i would say satisfaction like because because it's not expressing joy but it is the yeah. satisfaction of expressing emotion it could it could be that yeah like because yeah. you know you eat your are you joy or are you satisfied i'm fulfilled i'm satisfied Interesting. yeah it's, that's what it made me think um one thing you dawned on a couple of times is your dark night of the soul as a parent because it just struck me now i'm like oh because people, we see our kids go through 
these moody blues, like they come from being this more expressive person to staying right in that phase of just extreme moodiness. <laughs> how mm-hmm. how old do you think? Like, how long do you think it lasted? Like, how old were you? Like, what what was affecting you? Like, do you feel like that was external or just internal? That well, yeah, I've heard people talk about Dark Knight, but I never really thought to ask this before. Yeah. Um, I think mine was very internal. And I was around 15, 16, 16. Mm-hmm. So 16, 17, 18, and then a little bit continuing, like like it would like I would be in a better place for a while and then I would fall into it a little bit. Um, but never like I was when I was like 16, 17. So how long 18. did you say that? It, that's like three or four, four years. Um, I don't think it was quite that long. I think I was like later in my 16th year and then most of my 17th year. And then, um, yeah, I remember for whatever reason, like I was on the upswing on my 18th birthday, but like still getting treatment. Like I remember that distinctly. Um, so so somewhere in there and then it would get better. And then, you know, I'd have these ebbs and flows. Um, but I think so much of it was internalized. Like nobody was pressuring me. Nobody was from the outside necessarily. I mean, I had some family stuff, like a, a, a troubled parent basically. Um, but it was definitely me internalizing everybody else is smarter than me. Everybody else is better than me. Everybody else knows things I don't understand. And then just looking at the world. Like I remember if I saw anything on the news about, you know, war and awful things happening, people doing hateful things to groups of people or individuals, you know, um, and even like television programs and movies, I would just sob. I would just like, anything would just make me cry um so and I think for young people because I you know I mostly teach students between the ages of 18 and 22 my primary Mm -hmm. you know even though I work with people of all ages like the primary students that I work with are 18 to 22 and there's the effect of hormones right like there's all the hormonal and but so much of our world especially now with technology which we didn't have right so I was born in the mid-60s you were born in the seventies. I would have never said that. Well, I would have said forties for you. I mean, like, no, you know, right. <laughs> I think, I think being in the spiritual world and being people that, that seek out growth producing experiences and uplifting, even if they're hard, like, you know, uplifting and expansive experiences, um, leads to like a youthfulness in people. Yeah. That's just and also genetics. I mean, who knows? Um, but, but so, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, um, one of my sidelines of study is about anxiety and depression and mindfulness, because I was watching my students experience things like I was an outlier. Nobody in my school that I knew about experienced depression and anxiety. Like they didn't know what to do with you at that, you know, in this, in the, I guess that would be the early eighties. Like nobody knew how to deal with that with a young person, right? Whereas just now, act right, just act right. And nobody said that to me. Nobody yeah. said that to me. My dad was the sweetest, and he, he was, he did everything he could, and he. I know it was very confusing for him, um, but he never said any of that. Like just right. get it together, just go do the things you're supposed to do. Um, so I was very fortunate, but I see so many young people, and I think so much of it is. I'm circling back to the technology thing. You know, we we saw magazines, we had TV ads, if you had TV in your house, which most of my friends did, but I've known people that didn't grow up with TV, which makes a difference because you're seeing all these images of these these actors and people that who, whose livelihoods is based on how they look, right? And so we compare ourselves to them and say, oh, I don't look like that. There's something like, what? You know, um, and then all the other things about achievement, you know, like the people that, that or doing the big important things, whatever that might be, you know, the valedictorian of your class, like, why can't I, I don't, I, I'm not that, you know, I was supposed yeah, to. That is it. difficult, yeah. Yeah, so now, but now the young people have all of this social media and so much more access to comparison, 
right? So I think it's natural for many people to compare themselves to other people and find themselves lacking. I mean, that's not across the board, but I think that's true for many humans to like outwardly say, oh, I'm not that, I'm not, I'm not doing all these big important things or getting the high grades or whatever it is, being a, a good athlete, um, being popular. And then on social media, it just exacerbates it all. So then, you know, young people are, first of all, not going out in the world and doing physical things, you know, not, they're not in their bodies, they're not outside playing like we did. And then they're seeing all these images and stories online and people are bullying each other online. So we didn't even have any of that. So I think there's much more anxiety and depression. Actually, there's research on it. That's that. That's not even me Um projecting that that's actually true there's huge a huge leap of anxiety and depression among young people hmm. which i think is part of the moodiness that you mentioned right yeah so are you feeling like coming through theater is at this school is theater a requirement at least like one credit oh, okay so anybody in your programs in any of the theater classes that that's a chosen elective Absolutely. So we do have a theater major and we have a theater minor and we have a dance minor. Um, and so students can choose to be in those programs, but they can also just choose to take classes. Um, so we have students who say, I don't want to be a major or a minor, but I want to come, you know, take acting class or take movement class or take. Um, we have a lot of students that aren't theater majors that work in our um our scene shop and our box office oh, yeah. and like learning those kind of that aspect of, of the theater and dance world. Um, and then a lot of students that like to work on productions as actors or backstage crew or helping build sets and costumes and things um, that are not theater majors, just because they, they liked it in high school and they just want to be part of it. It's um, fun. I've done it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, yeah. I've, done, can... I've done set building. I've yes. been like the craft woman, the craft table person. Yes. Um, I participate, but I went to school for digital media in one school and also film in another school in South Carolina. Oh, yeah. And um, I, I, I think I enjoy every aspect of it. I really do. Every little yeah. job that we had, even film, except for the fact that we had to use that old school film where you had to rent out all the lights. And I can't, you know, my, my little films, let's say they were very dark because <laughs> I would, I would like never be the good, good at lighting. So but um that's so cool that you did that though i i didn't study anything about film besides like a little bit of film acting class yeah you know? i'm wondering well bec because you talked about the full expression of emotion uh at one point i had actually gone to a therapist myself and he said that i was not using all five cylinders so if you think about all the gears of your car Mm -hmm. you have like happiness you got to be able to express happiness and sadness and anger and remorse like I don't I, w I wanted to find the diagram for this for a long time but I couldn't but he basically explained it like five gears of a car where you could burn out the gears if you don't know how to use them all mm. burn some of them out and, and he was like you're very good at expressing anger <laughs> But it was, it was like, but there's there was something between anger and and joy where you could express your dissatisfaction in a different way, and mm -hmm. uh, and th this is something that he was coaching me on at the time. But for you, you remained in joy, and I just got through watching that 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 movie Inside Out. Yeah, talking to my son about joy because joy is always trying to take the wheel but joy doesn't deal with problems she has to learn to deal with conflict and her parents i would see too it, it would be like they were trying to gloss things over like oh well and just always seeing the bright side but not allowing the person to express the dissatisfaction disappointment or sadness that they had and yeah. then of course sadness they're like we don't know what her purpose is but uh, there was one character who was very sad that he lost something. And she said, well, how did it make you feel? And she allowed him to express his sadness. And then I rewound the whole thing because I wanted to sit with my son and let him know, like, it's okay for you to have this sadness because this is why I'm asking you about this dark night. So I'm like, please, God, yeah. help me. Please help me. But, uh, yeah. but 
So he could see like, see when you're not happy, it's okay for you to express it. But if you could help me by telling me what it is that's making you feel this way, if you can identify and maybe express it, but then there were, you know, you have these different gears and the fullness of you. I think a lot of people think that they're supposed to just be happy and that's impossible and and it can't be expected of others. I would see this too when, when we went to church and I remember I had a friend, she went through a breakup and everybody was like, just, you know, it's kind of like saying, just get over it by trying to gloss it over. And I told her, I said, um, I'll hang out with you as long as you want and you don't have to smile if you don't want to. You don't have to smile. You don't have to, you know, always yeah. be in this state for me to be your friend. And um, I guess just seeing that you're working with kids there, it made me just think, should everybody probably take a class so they can learn how to express different emotions? I think this is what I learned when I watch movies. When I'm watching movies, I learn the lessons of, well, how people respond to one another, negative or positive, but how they express themselves. Would you think that this is something that all kids should do? That's such a great question, Erica. Um, I want to make sure I don't go too far off topic. So I will say- Let's Go as I'm far as you want. Express Missy. Let magical Missy just- Because I can just go oh. off on tangents and end up like girl. Right over there. Um, so, so there's a difference between joy and happiness. And now that I love that movie Inside Out, but now that you're saying it, it's making me think, it's unfortunate they didn't use the word happy instead of joy because happy- is usually a reaction to something external happening, mm -hmm. right? And then and then it kind of goes away. But same with with sadness, which is different from depression, right? So sadness about something, about whatever's happening, or anger, or whatever the emotion is, um, joy's different. So joy is like a state of being. Happiness is an emotion. Sadness is an emotion. Does that make sense? Yes. I've learned this because like, like I said, I love to study. I love to learn things. So I've done a lot of study. And I, um, the program I think I was mentioning to you before we started recording um, in, in that my integrative healing arts training, um, there were classes in mindfulness, which is, was really important to me. I wanted to study mindfulness and also um, like life coaching and spiritual coaching. And that I just read for pleasure and for um, growth, you know, personal growth. And so this idea that joy and happiness are not the same thing. So I can, so, so it, you're right that it is very important to acknowledge emotions and express them. And the trick is when we get stuck in one, right? So, so even, even if every day I, I allow myself to mm -hmm. um, experience joy um and I have practices that I engage in to, to elevate my joy. I still, you better believe when I drive in central Florida, <laughs> my, my, like, I am like a dragon. I just want to, I just want to rip people's heads off when they drive oh, um, okay. dangerously or, you know, weaving in and out of traffic quickly or whatever. I get really like my anger. I'm like, ah, oh, stop it. Um, but I also know how to let it go. Like I know okay, I don't need to hold, I don't need to go home being angry because somebody cut me off and could have caused an accident because that's not helpful to anybody, right? It's not fixing anything. Um, and then same with sadness. And you were mentioning your friend who, who had a breakup, which is a huge life event, right? And it's, there's so many layers to it and telling someone to get over it is a hundred percent not helpful. Um, but I do know people that get caught, they create their identity around a big event, like a loss. And then they talk about it forever, that they always refer back to that for years oh. and years, you know? And so that's also not helpful because we are not the things that we've had that have happened to us, right? Um, we've experienced them, but they're not who we are. So if I walk around saying, oh, I don't know. I was fired from this job when I was 22 and my life has been terrible ever since. And now I'm in my forties or whatever. Like that's, that's a story you've created around an event that happened years ago. And you're, you know, like creating this 
the state of being of sadness or whatever, which is different from depression, which, um, you know, I, 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 I've read a lot of books about depression and anxiety, partly to help my students, partly just because I'm interested. Um, and can you still hear me? I think you froze. No. Okay. No, um, my face just gets like that. <laughs> no, 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 no. But, but also my internet, I told you earlier that my internet was it's a little, like, it's wonky. No, I love it. Um, no, but my internet gets wonky. So I just want to make sure I'm not, I'm not, that it's not coming through. Um, so, so one of the books I read and I am not a doctor, I am not a trained counselor. I'm not a therapist, but one of the books I read recently talked about how the idea of brain chemistry and needing medication for brain chemistry was something that was created by the pharmaceutical industry. Now, I didn't dig deeper into that, so I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but I think part of my own depression was circular thinking around the bad things. So I'm not saying everybody can get themselves out of their depression and anxiety, but I think looking back, I was so wrapped up in focusing only on the bad, sad things. I'll say this because you talked about circular thinking, because that's something I suffered with um, having repeatedly thinking about that thing that happened at school today mm. or that thing that someone said to me. And as I got older, I, uh, I would just, I remember I had to just be miserable. I had to be the most the most difficult person to be around. And I had no idea because like you're saying, like I would externalize all my problems. Like all my problems were based on these external things that someone did this to me, someone said that to me. And, and then these would be the things that fill my mind. And there mm -hmm. would be the reason why I feel or think would be this. And then I went to a therapist myself and I was like, give me the medicine. I was like, give it to me. <laughs> Cause I was like thinking like, oh, if I go and I get medicine, then I'll just feel better. And my therapist told me, he said, what you need to do is deal with your conflict mm -hmm. and say what you need to say and get it off your chest. And then you can stop thinking about it. And, mm -hmm. and, and then he said, now, and go back to school, get mm -hmm. out <laughs> and then get like, get, get out of my office. You know, there's nothing wrong with you. Like, it's nothing wrong with you. Maybe he, you know, and too, like he, people do treat you wrong and you want to be depressed about it, but you need to get over it. You kind of do need to get over it because you just need to understand some people are just shitty. Okay. So some people are actually crappy and it really isn't you that you need to deal with it and 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 tell the person I don't like that you did that or you hurt me when you did that or you did it and one of the biggest people that I had to stand up to at that time was um, my mom mm. and yeah. so I remember getting in an argument with well not even an argument what happened was I was supposed to pick her up from work and I fell asleep but what was I doing before I fell asleep her laundry and cleaning in her house, mm -hmm. right? And so I fell asleep and she came home, she got a ride and she just lit me up. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm sorry. And she just kept going. And, you know, normally I would just be like, mm -hmm. but, you know, I went to my house and I called her back and she hung up on me a couple of times and I kept mm -hmm. calling her back. And I said, um, you know, I hurt you, but I hurt you on accident. But the things you do to me, you do on purpose. Mm -hmm. And wow. I never know. It was like victory. Like I, I felt somewhat better, but then I stood up for myself and I was actually telling the truth. And I think that kind of set me on a roll with people to be like, don't dump your dirty garbage in my yard and let it funk up my yard. I'm going to give you your dirty, dirty garbage back. And I'm going to go on with my life. And the next thing was church because I remember one day missing church and they sent somebody to me because they were like, Erica, we're really worried about you because you missed church today. Do you know that you hurt Jesus? This is the kind of stuff that they were doing, right? So you're telling me that I'm crucifying Jesus because this was their way of manipulating and controlling you and making you feel bad about every damn thing you do. Mm -hmm. And I turned around to this girl and I said, 
you know, I don't need anyone to help me feel bad. I feel bad all day, every Uh day with every decision I make. I'm judging myself and saying, did you do the right thing? Did you hurt this person? Did you step on that person's toe? Because I have that internal dialogue with myself and my internal dialogue is always judging me. Mm. And I don't need you to come to my job and tell me because I missed church today that I hurt Jesus. So in so it was like, you know, that built-in religious oppression that and and I would say not all churches are like that, but there's this thing, you know, when you have sex, Jesus is watching, God is watching, your grandma's watching. Like you really can't enjoy too much of <laughs> many things. When you have all these built-in things of these things that people have taught you to guilt you and manipulate you. And it's Mm -hmm. like over time, I've been able to shed those things. And, you know, even like people like Michelle is like, oh, why should you feel bad about expressing your feelings? Why should you feel bad about any of your feelings? You're allowed to feel all of your emotions and you don't have to feel guilty about it. But anyhow, I don't know if you had any of those experiences, but it just, when it talks about emotions, I guess, and even that that show inside out and even being able to act, it's like to be able to tap into those emotions. And maybe that's why I wanted to talk to you because I was like, oh my, you have such a, a unique experience to be able to, especially even to see young people and are they being affected by the roles that they're playing with these plays? Yes. Yes, the answer is it's free flow on that. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so I think I think acting training can be valuable to to many people for different reasons. Um, and it depends. There's so many different acting techniques and different approaches. Um, you were asking about the the learning about expressing emotions. If you have some that you're not used to expressing, they're not like you talked about the five cylinder or five the five gears. Yeah, I never drove a stick shift in my life, but yeah, the different gears. Um, So there actually is this technique called Alba emoting that came out of the world of psychology is my memory. I never studied it. I just read about it a little bit. And I know it was really popular in theater for a while. And it was something about expressing, I think it was like facial expressions and breathing patterns. I'm not really sure to express different emotions um, to help yourself process and get to the emotion when it was appropriate in your life you like to learn how to feel it in a manufactured way like a created way so then then you could live it in your life when it was appropriate but also not hold on to it so that's the other thing is that when I when I work with actors with any kind of exercise that brings up emotion um I always tell them that we're looking at how to get into it and how to get out of it in the, in the, for the character. I that, can imagine because yeah, this could trigger something that they haven't yes. dealt with in the in yes. their childhood. And, and now you got like a really broken kid that's like, ah, you know. No, it's true. And I, you know, I tell my students that the uh, theater training, especially acting training is not therapy. And that so many people would benefit from therapy if they find the right therapist. So back in the, you know, early eighties, when I was seeing people, um, you know, because, the school counselor like advised my dad on like they were just trying to help right Mm -hmm. but there's so many newer techniques now like therapeutic techniques and I'm not an expert um but I know that there's cognitive behavioral psychology or or therapy there's um there's a lot of somatic like therapies that help you and I don't know because again not an expert not a doctor but that that you learn how to feel like where do you feel this in your body so you're saying you're sad. Where do you feel it? And then they work with you um, in a physical embodied way so that it doesn't get stuck. Right. So what you're talking about with uh, um, always judging yourself and that's so common, Erica. I mean, just I mean, I, I used to do I've gotten so much better with it. But I do. If I say something that feels a little snarky or feels like I've snapped at a student, which I, I rarely do, but sometimes if they're pushing my buttons, you know, and it's um, and then afterwards, I'll just say, oh, I shouldn't have snapped at that student. I should have kept my pay, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, and I tell myself I will apologize. They po- and, and, and often they're like, I don't remember that. I don't, you know, like it was a bigger deal to me than to them sometimes. Um, 
So learning how to, to not get caught up, like, like you said, to take an action. So if you hurt somebody's feelings, you apologize and say, I am so sorry that I hurt you. I apologize. Please tell me what I can do to make it up to you because I should not have done that. And I recognize that right. Instead of, instead of beating yourself up about it oh. or doing nothing. Right. And then sometimes there's not, you know, um, I had a conversation with a friend recently talking about a family member who just keeps pushing buttons until they get the outcome they want. And that's kind of a, you know, unfortunate, we might call it a dysfunctional behavior. Um, and there's only so much we can do, right? Cause our family, we can't walk. I mean, we can, we can walk away from our family and say, I cannot be around you or talk to you. I can't for my own well being. Um, but most of us don't do that. You know, we don't want to do that to our, every family member. Um, so then we have to work on ourselves. How do we not internalize it? How do we say, that is not me. That is them. That that they are treating me this way because they are hurt, and I can feel the hurt of what they're putting on me. But I can also understand it's not really mine, and I can learn how to sort of release it because I don't need to hold on to it. Right. Um, I know one thing that's helped me with that is um, there's this one scripture, and it talks about the. Um, that people are helpless and harassed. So for the most part, people are very ignorant of feelings and emotions and they don't know how to process them. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're lashing out at you, but then they're, they're, they're helpless and harassed. And so they don't even, they don't even know who they are. Most people are completely unaware. I remember, I don't know, when did you become aware of yourself when you said, why am I so angry? Like, you know, when that feeling comes over and you're like, where did this even come from? No, nothing just happened. Yeah. But this feeling just came over me. Yeah. I want to be mad right now, or I want to break something right now. I want to be angry right now. And and then you're you're like, well, oh, is this really me? And and have you when did you reach that point where you become aware of the ones, the emotions that aren't you, even yours? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so again, it's years of study and training and practice you know, I've been a lifelong learner. And as you know, from my earliest twenties, when I started sort of the self study and reading everything I could of interest in this vein, and then when mindfulness became so in the, you know, vernacular of our culture, I started studying that, um, that like when I'm driving, especially, cause that's when I get the maddest, <laughs> I get mad, I get mad about, about social injustice in general you know, when, when people with power make terrible decisions that are harmful to groups of people, we don't need to go off on a tangent about that, but you know what I'm talking about, or even a, like a single person, like a single person where I work, a student or somebody yeah, bullying, staff. bullying. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Like that's what I'll respond to, but driving. I'm usually, is <laughs> I'm usually quicker to defend another person than I am myself. Mm, like I got a high tolerance for me. Yeah. But then when I see other people the, and see, even still that gets you in trouble because sometimes you can't help people because they stay defenseless mm -hmm. and they have to learn to stand up and express themselves. And mm -hmm. here you are, you sticking your eye in it and then you end up being the bad guy uh, because you're in the middle of somebody else's stuff. Like sometimes it's, it's good to be able to do that. But then now we're learning what about karma when it comes to, do you want to take on other people's karma? Because they have to learn their own lessons, right? I have yeah. to defend myself. No right. one could sit there and just save me every time. Yeah. But that's yeah. sort of victim mentality, right? Yeah. That some of us are, are caught up. I mean, I think I might've had some of that when I was younger, like in, in this, you know, this time frame where I was dealing with depression and anxiety. I think that was also like a little bit of why me, why does everybody else seem to be okay and living their life? Um, but that's, that's a behavior that we have learned as an, a, to adapt to something. Right. Mm -hmm. And many behaviors, you know, there's, I'm not an expert on this either, but like there's some level of our personality that we are kind of born with, but then we also pick up behaviors because of how we've been raised and our experiences and anything we've learned in terms of a coping mechanism, we can learn something new. Right. But we have to decide 
that. So in reference to when people are are bullying or mistreating, um, we can always say, is it my business to step in? Because it might be my business to step in. It might be, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes. And that's tricky to know, right? Like, right. Um, I read this interesting book recently by someone who I actually did a training program with several, like years ago, we were in the training program together and he, um, Dr. Scott Lyons, he wrote this book called addicted to drama. Ooh, it's brand new, like new came out in like spring or summer this year. And I just listened to all of it. And it's, it's, it's pretty great. He's a, gosh, I don't know. He's got multiple degrees and trainings. Um, so I think he's, I don't know if he's a clinical psychologist or a therapist. I'm not sure what his title is exactly, but it's pretty great. But it talks about how, um, some people because of their life experience need to create drama. They like, they don't, they don't feel okay unless they are actually every, like everything's more elevated. Um, and we all know people like this. I, I have another whole side to that too, is that, um, what I'm seeing is because I, I put things in perspective of churches because you know, you can go to church, right? Like I went to a particular church and everyone that I've ever been to, because I've always been trying to be like, I need to be with God, you know, how do I connect with God? And so on this journey, I'll go to these different churches and you go to this one and they say, they're the only one. We are the only one. And so, and that means that everybody who goes to any other church, if you're a Buddhist, if you're a Hindu, if you're Jewish, if you're Catholic, they're all going to hell and we're going to heaven because we're the only ones and we're the one that's right. And people, I think, have adopted this mentality that for me to be good, other people have to be bad. Yes. Yes. So there's always this thing, like you said before, even with body and comparing, but it's it's on so many levels. For me to be good, someone has to be bad. For me to be right, everyone else has to be wrong. And yes. so we're against everyone because we've adopted these mentalities that, well, how can I be right and she be right? How can I be pretty and she be pretty? You know, how can I be smart and that person be smart? Because you have to be smarter, right? Or the smart test. So mm-hmm. we turn everything into this competition, even, you know, even in this spiritual culture in this climate of spirituality I still see it people build they're like building new churches and if you don't listen to this person and read this book then you just can't have it made you know no one can just walk their walk without you know without being judged because you're not in this group or on this path or you know like we can just choose right I always think of it like a spaceship if if someone is the captain, somebody has to be the engineer. Somebody has Mm -hmm. to run the holodeck. Somebody, and guess what? Somebody has to go sweep in the back. You know, somebody has, (laughs) like there has to be these different roles where we're, and then you can still just be right in your role. Yeah. My people too now too, I, cause I always talk about this is I'm just a mom or, or a person who feels bad because they don't have kids or whatever your role is. And it's funny you say roles, right? Whatever role we're playing right now, you're you're in the right role. You're in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing. And you don't have to do what everyone else is doing. I think this is what drives people too. Like they have to learn every modality and they got to buy every device and they got to have every crystal. Because you imagine if you never, <laughs> if you have to just run and buy every crystal and every device and every, and you have to go to every kind of meeting and every kind of class and join every kind of group, you know? but people can't be satisfied within this realm, but I'll be quiet. Cause <laughs> no, that was awesome. I love that. But I yeah. Loved all of that. yeah, it's, it's very, it's very Western culture. That idea of striving for success. Like, what does it mean? Really? You know, um, I tell my students that when I was younger, uh, my my closest friends and I all love theater. We all love participating in theater. And some of my high school friends talked about how we were all going to move to New York and we're going to audition for plays on Broadway. And I would I would always say, I'm not. Mm-hmm. I have no interest in living in New York. I love New York to visit. 
I did not want to, even when I was young, I knew that I was like, I do not want to live there. It's crowded and busy and loud and, you know, overwhelming for me. And every single one of them at some point lived in New York. And I'm the only one that is still working in theater. And so what I tell my students is I knew New York was not for me, that all I cared about was doing work that felt meaningful. I wanted to feel good in my acting. Like I wanted to feel like I had, had grown to a certain skill level as an actor and as a director. And that what's most meaningful to me is, is, encouraging younger people and helping them find their highest level that they can reach in this moment um, without a a sense of competition. And so I tell them, you know, I don't feel like I lost out on going to the big city to see if I could be an actor in that world because I didn't want it. Um, And that is not, to me, that is not, um, that is not a negative, you know, like some people say, oh, didn't you want to make it in New York? I'm like, no, I had no desire. So, so I, I, like I, I was setting my own set of goals and parameters and they were much kind of smaller, I guess you could say, than wanting to go to New York and star on Broadway. Um, and I see nothing wrong with that because I am happy and I have lots of joy. Um, but some of that's a choice. So like, it, but so my, back to my point is like in America, especially there's this sense of you need to, you know, do all the things. And if you're a mom, well, tell me all the great things your kid is doing. And it's like, Why? You know, if my if my child is is living a life with moments of happiness and joy and doing things that they enjoy at different times, then that is amazing. That yeah. is amazing. Accompl- that, you know, we talk about accomplishments. That is an accomplishment. Um, it's like that idea, of, like I don't have kids. And I'm like in my life, I've just about never been asked, like, why don't you have kids? Oh no. You know, like like a lot of my friends that don't have kids, they said people would ask them, like, oh, well. Don't you feel you missed out? I'm like, no, I do not feel I missed out. I not me. People, I, somehow people know. Do not ask Missy these things. But um, but it wasn't. Maybe it's wasn't true happy. because you present yourself as a very happy person in the first place. Well, thank you. Like, how could someone ask you well, why when you're like, well, she looked happy? So yeah. Well, and I wanted to invest in what I was doing with teaching, and. I, I, for me, I felt it would split my attention too much that I wanted to be able to give my energy for my students and the work I was doing, and then also have enough energy to take care of me and do what I want, you know, instead of that, that, that really damaging thought of, we need to do it all, especially if you're a female identified person that you need to do it all. Like, that's not even a thing. Like, it's not feasible. I'm and starting it's to wonder because I'll tell you something about even with my own son, right? I remember one time we went to get a sub and he asked for a vegetable sub, but he only got like lettuce, tomatoes, and maybe pickles. I can't remember, but it was only three things. And then I said, babe, it's a vegetable sub. You only got three vegetables. He said, I don't care what other people put on their sub. And I was like, Ooh, I respected that. I was like, oh my God, he really is an individual. He really wants to do it just the way that he likes it. Yeah. But then I'm noticing too, I, I'm just think comparing you to him in a way that maybe because you guys had such self-awareness that you're going through this dark night at such an early age because you're mm-hmm. so much aware of your individuality. And you see yourself separated from the world. It's like really the true sign that you are a star seed, right? Early on, you you see yeah. yourself and and seeing the world as it is, and that that's why too. Once you got over your dark night, that now you're able to make these choices. As I'm an individual, I don't have to do what everybody does. It, it's like it's like you're being born early, like you're breaking out early where some some lessons people don't learn until they're in their 30s right after they've already been married and then they've already had kids and then they're looking at their husband like huh you know <laughs> like how do I claw myself out of this situation because they kind of just move forward from one goal to the other without any thought of is this what I really really want yeah. or am I just trying to imitate this life and then once they have it all, they're looking at it like, what the hell is it, you know, that I have? Mm-hmm. Is it even what I really wanted? And so, I mean, I noticed that people, not all people, but some people maybe do that. And 
you know, now that you're in the 30s and 40s and you have the family, now you're clawing for freedom. I really don't think everybody's supposed to be a mom or a dad. I feel like maybe, well, you know how it is um, in America. I think we're marketed, our whole lifestyle is marketed, right? With you're supposed to go to church on Sunday, like this was zip. And you're supposed to have a family, 2.5 kids, a, mm -hmm. you know, a car, and then now all of that is being broken to let people know like this was our our hair our our identity in America is all manufactured and marketed to us a hundred percent yeah like even patriotism if you think I don't know if you've heard of paid patriotism there's mm -hmm. certain events where they put the military and the flag and they're pay it, it, it like say the the NFL gets paid to do that whole ceremony in the beginning. A lot of people think this is, it's just a tradition, but it is it, it's a paid patriotism to promote the military and to promote um, your loyalty to America and the flag that they do this. Yeah. I did not know that. I so there's just these that. little mind control techniques, you know, like yeah. when the TV was going off at night, there was the, you know, the national yes. anthem, like these things that are put in place. Um, all the little TV shows with Leave It to Beaver and you know, my oh, yeah. you know, all this stuff that's showing you this is America, this is what we do, this is America, this is what we do, and this is how life is supposed to be. Right. And so people I noticed too, they'll go out into the world and and try to live this life. And then they're wondering like, well, why am I not happy? On the TV, they were happy. They said we'll be happy. If you get married and go to church, you get a job, da, da, da. why am I not happy? So I feel like a lot of people are stuck trying to figure yeah. this out. But because you found your individuality early, you didn't get pushed into this pre-made cookie cutter lifestyle where Missy's sitting there with three kids like, what the did I do? <laughs> I don't want to clean up vomit. Like, I don't want to, <laughs> you know, I wanted a cat. <laughs> that's so I don't funny. Know. I don't know. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's interesting. And yeah, I teach, I mean, I talk to my students about a lot of this because while I, I teach performance, I also teach, I teach um, musical theater history oh. and I love history. I don't have the best memory for it, but I do know my musical theater history pretty well. But I had a student one time who told me that he relearned the very general history of America through that class. Because I talked about how the theater has reflected everything else in our country about oppressions and who has the means of control, the white men, you know, like who's making the decisions, who's writing the scripts, who's doing everything, getting the big, you know, the money um, and who's being told what to do or who's not even allowed to be part of it at certain times in history. Um, and and like that idea that that yes that you're supposed to be something that's supposed to be uh two people as a couple one who is considered man and one who's considered woman by whoever standards and then you're supposed to have the x number of kids and all that it is completely made up you're right it is made up um and even to the point of race, because when people say, oh, oh, you're you're not black or or to tell a white person you're trying to act black or, you know, like it's like, what the what the hell is this thing that you're calling white and black? Like if you went to Africa, would you tell somebody they're not acting black because of the way that they speak or um, the style of clothing they choose to wear? It's only in America that we can say you're yeah. acting like or what you seem like is like uh, you know you, you don't no, find yeah, somebody's yeah. culture how do you define somebody's whole identity and it's then here to, i'll say this too because yeah. italians and irish are two different people right so how yes. do italians and irish act white or you yeah. know yeah. these people yeah. have different culture a, a catholic or you know if you're a catholic from england Maybe if you put Catholic in there, they, they have like a maybe certain thing that they do, but you you can say, well, you know, they're, it's crazy. But then because, it, you know, a person from Jamaica, a person from Africa, a person from, um, you know, an, Australia. America, or even, a, yeah, an Aboriginal from, you, how, who do you get to tell like, well, who gets, which one of them gets to define what it is to be Black? So, right. This, 
It's a hot yeah. here. It's it's all the scam, you know. In- it is all made up. Yeah, it's all it is, made up. And it was all made. I mean, I'm again not an expert, but um, I I teach my classes from this perspective of who is out of history, who's been. Um, I think. Oh, just for a second, I froze. Uh, the screen froze. Um, who's, you know, who actually did the work? And who does not get credit for the work and, you know, all of that stuff I teach because I teach at a private college. Um, And, and, you know, there's this, this idea that, that human bodies were sold to make other people rich, right? At a certain point in our history, we know this. Mm-hmm. We, right? Well, we and a this. lot of the history, because it didn't just happen in America. No, it happened yeah. all over the world, all, all over, over the world. world. And so somebody made up this idea of what race meant. Um, my husband has done some research on this. He's also a theater. Um, well, he, he's an English professor, but he's also a theater artist. And his he he just like me, he likes to read a lot and and learn different things. And um, there was a time, and he's a Shakespeare specialist. So in Shakespeare's time when they used words like race, what they meant was you came from a different country. It had nothing to do with what skin color or what other physical attributes you might carry and what, um, you know, it was about the country you came from. And so it was like, it was made up this idea of, of this group versus that group so that some subset of people could hold the power and make all the money. And that's, that's what America, you know, like this idea of, um, Ah. X, X number of kids in a car and a house with a picket fence or whatever that story is. It's all about commerce. It's all about somebody making money, right? They wrote a book okay. about it. It's called The Manufacturing of Consent. I love that. The Manufacturing of Consent. Right. And so, wow. like, how do we get put into these categories? Um, Girl, I got this huge crap across my back. <laughs> Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! I gotta move. Okay. Uh, but yeah, I I did also. I I think this is wonderful that you get to talk about that to the kids, and I think like you have the ability to help them uh, become individuals in the aspect of your teaching. One thing I know I did want to ask you about what what is maybe one piece of literary work that you that is not made into a play that you wish was made into a play that you guys could work on. Oh, wow. A piece of literature. There's so many like books that I love and some <laughs> of them have, some of them have been made into into movies. That's a hard one. I mean, so I'll just say this. I I think it's great that in more recent times in the 21st century, people are creating plays and musicals that reflect different people's perspectives and experiences because there was a time when, when musicals had, like they followed a formula and you mostly saw white people in the cast and they, that's who created the plays and the musicals and you know women were were written to be very stereotyped in these different categ- like narrow categories and now you see all these plays and musicals with different people's experiences being portrayed which i love i know i'm not answering your question but i will say this shameless plug for rollins we're producing the play raisin in the sun in oh. the spring and it's the first play in the spring we have this amazing guest artist director who's also who directed for us a couple of years ago and she's wonderful um and that is one of my favorite plays of all time like i think that play is so powerful and says so it's like it's it's like american history because when i when we when i talk about it in class students don't know some of the things that happened in that time frame um and lorraine hansberry who wrote it her her family like her family's experience is reflected in the play a little bit um but not exactly but like things she knew about and she experienced and um and so if that is a play that exists but I love it and I'm so excited that we're they were producing it um at Rollins and I can't yeah I, I, I'm, I'm not coming up with any I, like one idea I've had is like 
having a play that reflects different time periods and like different really well recognized figures and their like them kind of speaking their different experiences and what the world was like for them like by going through their biographies or their memoirs or you know whatever um and possibly there being arguments in the play about it, people from the same time period having different perspectives based on where they were and how they lived their life. Um, are there yeah. any student produced plays ever done? There are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do. Um, were they voted? The maybe? No, but we have, so we have a, um, a, a playwright series. So this year, one of my co this wonderful colleague in the English department who teaches playwriting, he's teaching his playwriting class this semester. And then early next semester, some of the plays will be selected to have a reading. Like, so actors will be cast to read the play out loud to help the playwright, you know, hear what changes they might make and to get suggestions or feedback from the audience and the actors. Um, we haven't often done like original work, but we do have some alums who are playwrights and we've talked about trying to maybe bring them to campus, like, like produce one of their plays and bring them. So that hasn't happened yet. Um, and then um, one of my colleagues has an improv troupe where Ooh. they do like the students are cast in the spring for the next whole academic year. And they, um, they do improv improvisational work with different themes. Often the theme is about what's happening in the world or it's related to, to one of the plays that's being done. And then, and that's really student-centered, even though a faculty member leads it, it's like very student-centered. And then every um, season we have at least one, if not up to three student-directed plays, but like they, they choose a play that already exists usually. Um, so this year we only had one student who wanted to direct because like they have to propose and have taken the, the classes to be ready to direct a whole play kind of on their own with some mentorship. Um, and we're doing this play called Aunt Jack, um, which, which is about gender identity. I'm not, I don't know the details of it because I like to see play. If I haven't been part of the selection process to read the play, I like to not read it so I can show up and be a, a more traditional audience member and take it all in for the first time. Um, so yeah, so the students tend to choose plays that are very much centered in things happening in our country right now. Um, so have you seen, um, is there just one play you, you would say, I never ever want to work on this. This is not one that I would want to work on or want my students to work on. Oh, there's, there's a lot of musicals from the like early early mid 20th century that I'm like, I, th these plays don't need to ever be done again, unless they're done in a really unique way. Yeah. Because they're so, they just stereotype everyone and they're very exclusive, you know, exclusionary. And I just have no interest. Um, and I used to joke, there's this one musical called paint your wagon, which is almost all men. And I, yeah. I, I don't love the music and I have no interest. There's a movie of it with Clint, Clint Eastwood is in it, I think. Um, yeah, it's just not my favorite. And then there are musicals and, and plays that I just don't, like um, there are these different playwrights um, whom I think, so maybe Sam Shepard is an American playwright who um, died some years ago. He was also an actor, he's in several films. But he, I just didn't understand his plays. Like, I, it just, I read them and I'm like, I know there's all these metaphors and it's, I just don't get it. So I wouldn't want to direct a play I don't resonate with because that wouldn't, it wouldn't turn out very well, you know? Um, but yeah. And yeah, any, anything that's about like important issues, that's what I most want to direct. Oh, gosh, I think I lost my question. So, um, I liked Rent. Yes. You know, Rent is so interesting. I, I taught it for years in my musical theater history class. Mm -hmm. And now students see it as really dated. Oh. Because, you know, it's- Well, it is because it's the issue yeah. of HIV epidemic or something. Was, right. was that a big part of that? Um, um, uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. A couple of the characters are HIV positive. Um, one thing that always irked me about the musical is that 
because I remember when it came out and people were like younger people in particular were just obsessed with it. And the first time I saw it in Chicago. I like the percussion. I think I just really love the yes. percussion. No, yeah. it's fun. Yeah, some of the music is really cool. And for its time, it was cutting edge. And I love the song La Vie Boheme. But so I saw it in Chicago. Um, Chicago and some of the big cities like Chicago, Boston, LA have a Broadway house that that runs the show like for a, an extended period of time, like sometimes for years. So it's not Broadway, but like it's a professional cast that's there running the show the same time it's in New York. And so I saw it in Chicago and I remember the building was shaking because the stu- like the young people in the audience were like stomping and clapping, like cheering so much that I could feel the seats shaking. Like they were so excited. And one of the things that, that set me off about it is that it's these, these pretty spoiled younger people saying, we're not going to pay our rent. And I like, I just, you know, it's like, why? I I, I mean, there's a whole thing about how the character Benny supposedly told me they didn't have to or whatever. I don't really know. Um, Some of that's confusing to me, the story. Um, But I love that it's young artistic people that are wanting to make a statement in the world and live differently. Like, I do appreciate that about it. And some of the music is just really great. But I have never worked on it. A couple of times we talked about doing it. One, a couple of years ago, we were trying to do it. We couldn't get the rights um, because you have to pay for the rights. Like you have to apply for the rights to produce such yeah, a play musical. And it was supposed to go on tour because it was the 25th anniversary. And then COVID uh, oh, interrupted, yeah. like kept the tour from happening. So sometimes um, certain, like in the musical Chicago, which I've always liked. Um, I've it's never hard. seen that yet. Have you not? It's, it's, it's interesting, um, but it's hard to that point particular musical um because everybody wants to do it so there's yeah there's certain musical and then musicals like um like relatively recent ones like Hades Town and Hamilton which you know is like running who knows how long maybe forever it feels like um if they're running you can't get the rights to produce them wow. you know because it's still running professionally in New York and then on tour and in other big cities so um you can't you can't get the rights to do those until they release them to colleges and universities. Well, I didn't even know there was that much politics involved in it. You know, you just think of it as a school play. And yeah. I mean, and it is, but, but yeah, like you, if you try and if people have done this, which we would never do, um, but people like, get their hand, well, people get their hands on the materials, like the scripts and the music, and then they produce it without permission. And that is a no, no. And Nobody should do that. Um, but we would never do that. We would wait until. Oh, you guys amazing. have way too big of a reputation to worry about yes. doing stuff like that. Well, and then the people aren't getting paid, right? Like it's it's only fair that people get paid for the work that they created. If you are using their work, then you know, like right now, there's a um, Screen Actors Guild and um, Screenwriters Guild strike, which has been ongoing for months because they're not paid as well as the upper, you know, the CEOs and the, and so why would you want to do something that harmed someone who created this work if you're, you know, so anyway, so yeah. So one day we'll be able to pr- look, look at those kind of musicals and, and produce them, but not for a while. Um, I guess I would not, especially when it comes to that writer's strike, I know everybody wants to get Hollywood money, but uh, I just, I also think, what if everyone just gets together and just leaves Hollywood and creates a new Hollywood or decide like, you know what, let's let's go work with the kids at the schools instead, instead of um, feeding into the hierarchy that's been created with that fantasy world there. And uh, I guess, I don't know if you've ever seen how much money people made each cast men- member on any of the Marvel movies, which I know people love Marvel movies, but when you see that every person on there made $32.7 million and you're like, for what? <laughs> I, 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 I can't. Yeah. I mean, for what? To be on a green screen, to use your yeah. face on a green screen. I don't know. Yeah. I, I kind of think like I'm, I'm this paranoid person. that's like, this looks like money laundering. How could 11 people make 32 point? 
I don't know. Absolutely I mean, I ridiculous. But then I here we go as moviegoers and stuff like that, that like, like there's this system that we feed into and it's like, well, who's going to be the one to say, all right, I'm done. Drop the mop and let's all go because yeah. I don't know. I don't care about Marvel that much. Um, I'm not a Marvel follower or fan, but yeah, I mean, I, I think this is a whole political conversation but I'm not a it's fan a system. Yeah, it's just of the a, possibility yeah, yeah, of like a system that allows a small number of people to make that much money while there are other people working on the same project that are getting paid minimum wage probably or, you know, like whatever, like a barely livable yeah. wage. Um, so I, I think there needs to be like an exodus, like, all right, we're done. Let's go to the schools. Let's go local. Let's build our own stuff and yeah let's let's build mollywood <laughs> <laughs> somebody actually just wrote an article about theater doing that because theater also got corporatized everything it feels like in this country has been corporatized almost because colleges and universities certainly have been um but theaters too where where there's this this like structure of the people in charge who make the top money and then the the, the actors and the people doing the the crew work and you know, doing the the hands-on hard stuff, building the sets and all, you know, all the things, costumes and all of the things are getting paid way less, like not some often not a living wage. Um, again, that imbalance is it's it's a huge issue in this country. I was trying to think of it. There's one man, he wrote his own movie. He did so, so much work on his own movie, and then he wanted to get it in theater. Oh, uh-huh. Oh, Sorry, and, no, and um, he he was unable to get it on screens. It's like how they'll show it on how some movies get one screen, some movies get three screens, and all these different showings. And you can only get one showing for your movie, or maybe they don't even play your movie in New York at all. They only play it in these certain places. So yeah, there's a there's a lot that goes on that maybe people don't know when it comes to movies on. Yeah, this whole political thing behind it that says this is who is successful and this is who isn't. So, yeah, it's it's very difficult thing. And sometimes I even look at that with music artists, too, because you can hear a lot of beautiful singers and, and songwriters and their work. This person gets it and this person doesn't. You know, I'm sure people that watch this channel, they have we all have our own reasons or thoughts about on who gets what. But uh, I always look at my friends because I have plenty of friends that are musicians and songwriters. Mm -hmm. And I just think, why do you still do it? I know it's because it's just in them and they have this love for this thing that is completely controlled and they make so much music and art. And it's, it's like, you know, just this fraction of people get to hear it and they work so hard to try to be seen and mm -hmm. then I just think sometimes like, well, what, what, what's the end of it? But maybe that's just, well, you know, like you said, what is success? And success for them is just doing the work that they love. Like, you know, I could say the same thing. Like, why do I have a YouTube channel? I don't know. I, I don't get paid. I don't, I haven't got a penny of monetization or anything like that. But it's like, I just like talking to people and sharing it. So <laughs> I guess I'm in that same category. Yeah. And I mean, like you, you, you said the word feed, like it does feed us, right? Like I'm getting so much out of speaking with you right now. Um, and I don't know how many followers you have and th like just the talking to you is value is the value to me. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think that's true for a lot of artists. Um, they do the thing because they love it. And the idea of not doing it is, is not even, they can't even think of that. Yeah. They're not be happy. Yeah. That's that idea. They say, like, if you had a million dollars, um, what would you do? Even, if, even if, you know, like you have all the money that you need, mm -hmm. well, well, then what would you do with your time? Right. And it's like, yeah, I'd still do this. I'd still be. You, right now. <laughs> yeah. Did you do you, do you get Hay House um, emails? No, but you know the publishing company Hay House that sells um, a lot of the books about healing and, and metaphysics and. They sell a lot of Oracle and tarot decks. So, uh, so um, 
there I just got I'm on their email list since so they just sent out an email and it talked about that it talked about how to to find the thing that you love doing and do that as your career yeah no I know that's hard you know like if you're a musician or an actor to actually make a living can be tricky but I but I like just change it to we'll do that thing have something else that you enjoy enough doing to make the money yeah I've always and told then, people to have your real job and then you got to, you have your dream job so that you can do your real job or your dr- real job so that you can do your dream job. Yeah. I mean, and sometimes it's overlap, you know, like for me, I love teaching students. I love working in the theater, um, but any college, college university, like I said, is like any business. So there's hierarchy and things I disagree with and all of that. But I focus on what's important though. It's, engaging with people and there's mutual growth and learning, you know, like I learn from my students every semester and my colleagues. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. What's the first um, play that you all will be producing this year? We are, um, it's called the 39 steps. It's based on an Alfred Hitchcock movie. I thought so. Yes, yes, yes. So it's really funny. Um, it's it's four actors, three of whom I think play multiple roles. Like some, a couple of them play a lot of roles. Um, and and so like the what's funny is is that you keep seeing the same people show up with slightly different costumes and things, and it's you know very um. Uh, like noir-esque I guess and like you know anyway I'm looking forward to I'm not working on it um one of my colleagues is directing but I know they get to play with the wardrobe themselves it seems like the students seem to be able to mix because the last play I was that there was some mixing genres of the costumes where yes did you see as you like it huh did you see as you like like it it. that's exactly as you like so um, as you like it yeah the 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 scenic designer for that is one of my amazing colleagues who I love working with. We love working together. And then I I co-directed it with a colleague who's a Shakespeare and voice specialist. Um, and then our costume designer is an alum. She's a, she's like, she came, she went to Rollins and she was a costume design student and I worked with her. And so she, we often hire her to do um, as a guest artist because she has her own shop and she, she does all this, you know, she has a whole career, but she comes and, um, designs for us and when we came up with the idea that it was a playground because we wanted to use um yeah. I, I, saw, I wanted things to climb on and around and through and my scenic designer colleague said um she said we have a slide and swings in our backyard that the girls her daughters were are, don't play with anymore because they're older they're teenagers and they have no desire and we were going to get rid of it but how about if we use it on the set and I was like yes please Yes, please. A slide and swing sounds perfect. Um, so then we talked about how we weren't in a specific place in time because, you know, a lot of people produce Shakespeare plays, which is what As You Like It is, um, outside of the time period that it was originally written for fun, because you can, because there's no rules about it, because it's what's called public domain, where anybody can take a Shakespeare right. play. And, it yeah. was amazing. Yeah, well, thank you. But anyway, so she, so the, so the idea was that it's like kids playing dress up. So that's why you saw the different time periods, even though that probably wasn't clear to the audience. But just like we, she looked at different genres and different cultures. So there was people were laughing. Yeah, people were yeah. laughing, and I was like, had they heard this joke before? Because I was because the language. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I. I. And Shakespeare is, is not like awfully difficult to me, but you're hearing it for the first time. And these kids, they were like, just going, going, going. It was really, it seemed really fast paced. And I was like, have they heard this joke before? Like, wait a minute, I had to process the joke first and then I could laugh. But everybody was, <laughs> it was as if everybody had seen it before I did, or, or maybe they had seen it before at some point, but um, they did a wonderful job with those lines and they were just going and they were very expressive and I don't think I would sit so close to the front stage next time, but I'll move a little bit back. But I even remember Marissa and I both sitting there and I actually got emotional. Like for some reason, I don't remember what was the incident, but I started crying. <laughs> I was like, at one point I had like some tears and then I was like, I felt like a lot of emotions, like they did a very good job. Um, yeah. 
our, yeah, our they, I mean, I'm, I'm biased, but my our students are really talented. Like, and they're lovely, kind people, like big hearted people. I'm very grateful to work with such lovely. And I, again, learn from them all the time. Cool. Cool. So, um, Marissa, I mean, why am I saying that now, Marissa? Because you just said me. I know, Missy. So, um, what is some advice you would give people, um, whether it be about healing, joy, acting, um, fulfillment? Um, what's some advice that you uh, find yourself like? This is the message that I have for humanity that you would share. Yes, because you, I, the joy coach. Yeah, I I encourage people to make time to do things that bring them joy. I think so many of us. Or, you know, like want to give or we have so many obligations and we don't make time for ourselves. So I do an extended meditation every day when I'm teaching earlier in the morning, which will happen week, like starting this week. I have meetings early in the morning. It'll get shortened. Um, but to give themselves practices, um, I mentioned to you before we started recording that I, I'm a laughter yoga leader. And yeah. there you can find laughter yoga clubs all over the world. Um, the person that that developed it was a doctor from India, and there are um, over a hundred. Con- I think it's a hundred over a hundred ten. Excuse me, over a hundred ten con- countries where there are laughter yoga clubs, and you you can go. They have some online. You they have some in person. You can go for free, um, and do the silly exercises. They're sort of like acting and laugh because that's part of the practice. Is you you laugh you ha 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 until you start really laughing. And if you never really laugh, it doesn't matter because your body still has positive response to even created laughter. Um, and to do things that that yeah, whether it's sitting outside. Um, I love to read. I love to be outside. I love to um, like watch TV and film that makes me laugh or makes me cry. Like I don't just watch comedies. Like I love to watch things that, you know, make me want to cry, which I cry really easily, you know, because I said, joy, if you're going to have extreme experiences of joy, you're also going to experience all the other emotions um, pretty strongly because, you know, that strength is there for every emotion. So yeah, like that's it, that, that the more we show up for ourselves, the more we have to give. So when people say like, I don't want to be selfish, I don't want to be self-centered, I don't have time. You can do a 30 second meditation. You can do a 30 second prayer. You can just, you know, tell yourself, thank you, uh, gratitude. I'm so grateful and thankful that I get to live in this lovely home and I have food to eat, you know, whatever it is, 30 seconds. I think I was thankful for my blanket the other night. I was like, this is the nicest, softest blanket. I'm so grateful. (laughs) I love that. I, I, um, we had our electricity go off randomly one night in the middle of the night. And I just kept being grateful that I was going to assume it was going to come back on. Cause it didn't, there wasn't a storm or anything. I guess they were on something maybe. Mm-hmm. And when it came back on, I just spent like, I don't know, at least 10 minutes just saying, I'm so grateful and thankful for electricity and for air conditioning. <laughs> yeah. You know? Cause some people don't, you know, like when we don't have the things, it's really hard. Um, but when we can focus on what we are grateful for and what brings us joy, it just uplifts us and it can make our lives happier, better, more fulfilling, all the things. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Um, and I'm going to just say it's okay to feel all your emotions and not mm-hmm. to rush yourself through them, but not to get stuck in them. And I'm getting that from you, basically process it's 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 good to process i was feeling like this leo season and and um uh venus was in retrograde and i was like where is my beautiful venus as a libra i was feeling the struggle because i was like you should hit that person with a car like (laughs) i said wait a minute i don't usually hmm something's going on (laughs) But um, it's okay to process and it's okay to want to be alone and it's okay to, it's okay to go through your emotions and feel them without people just trying to rush you to feel happy and, and just 
don't try to bright side people so much, you know, like, no, no. you know, there's a term spiritual bypassing. Oh, I like that spiritual bypassing. I've heard it. Yeah. So, so that, and that's not exactly what you're talking about, but spiritual bypassing is when you, when you say that, well, if I am really connected and spiritual, then I don't need, then I don't have to feel all those other things. I only feel I'm always connected to spirit and I'm always happy and joyful. And it's like BS, like no human. <laughs> That's no love human. and light, right? That's the love and light. Um, Even the awesome. Dalai Lama, the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Tutu, they wrote this amazing book. Well, they didn't write it, but they, it, it exists because of them uh, called the book of joy. Hmm. And, um, and, and a writer spent time with them together and they're good friends. They were good friends because um, Desmond Tutu sadly passed, but he talks about like in the book, he talks about his anger. Like he talks about how, like I'm the spiritual leader, right? He was the spiritual leader of South Africa and um, Catholicism, Christianity. And he would talk, he'd say, I would get so angry. You know, cause people are like, how are you? So they're like, Oh no, I'm still human. I'm, I'm Archbishop, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and I get to be angry and sad and all the things, but I also get to bring myself back to joy because I know how to do that. I've, I've chosen that path. Um, anyway, I, I recommend that book. It's been around for a while. I use it with my students um, in my non-theater classes sometimes because I just love it. Um, but yes, we all have all the experiences and even the most elevated spiritual leader of the world, even they can have human emotions of annoyance or frustration or anger or sadness or whatever it is that's and it is okay and we don't have to beat ourselves up but we can learn to bring ourselves in an appropriate amount of time to like like you said process through and then bring ourselves back to the state that we prefer whether it's joy or peace or whatever and how do people find you for your 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 yoga techniques um so i mostly am using it at school right now Oh, okay. um, I haven't created a club, but if anybody wants to reach out to me, um, feel free to email me. Mm-hmm. Should I put it in the chat? Will it show yeah. up to people if I put it in the chat? Oh, well, I'm going to put it in the description. Oh, perfect. Okay. So I'm going to give everybody my email address, which you can find on the Rollins website because it is a public, um, a public institution. I mean, it's available to the public. Like our whole um, website is available to the public and my email address is on it. So I'll say it out loud, M Barnes, B-A-R-N-E-S at Rollins.edu. Yes. So this was yeah. absolutely wonderful. Oh, you're so awesome. Thank I you have- so much for inviting me. I'm so glad we got to talk. And uh me too. So I will end this session and check out the uh books that she's recommended in the description and her uh email address will be in the description. And I'll see you next time. Thank you so much.